So, St. Paul's, why did the chicken cross the road? Why did the chicken cross the road? Why did Jesus cross the lake? And what did he find on the other side? He was different. He was loud. He was naked. He made people feel uncomfortable. So what did they do? They drove him out of the city and forced him to leave, live outside of the community. He was strong. He was powerful. He was overwhelming. He was loud. He was scary. He was perceived as dangerous. So what did they do? They put him in chains. Why did Jesus cross the lake? And on the other side, he encounters a figure that represents you, me, and all of us. He's not given a name. Luke simply refers to him as the man. But certainly this man could have been someone's parent. He was definitely someone's son. And he has quite a reputation, this man. You can probably imagine his rants, his yelling. He's talking gibberish. You can probably imagine his unclothed body. You can probably imagine the sores on his skin around his ankles and wrists as he's pulled against those chains. You can imagine him because he's not much different than the people we see on our streets or the ones that we have encountered in medical facilities. They are the people who make us uncomfortable they are the people who make us walk just a little bit faster or lock our doors. And what do we do with people who scare us, people we don't fully understand or know what to do with? Well, if we don't put them in actual chains, then we create systems that keep them in chains. I think about some of the laws and policies in place now that keep people from living their fullest lives. And I particularly think about those Jim Crow laws that were intentionally developed to keep African Americans in their place. Why did Jesus cross the lake? Today Jesus has crossed the lake and he has landed squarely on the other side. And the other side is foreign territory. The first hearers of this gospel, the hearers of Jesus, would have seen it as a distant land filled with all kinds of unclean places and people. And our story mentions a lot of them. And those first hearers would have squirmed in their seats when they hear about this man who himself epitomizes what society would have definitely considered unclean. You see, in that day, anyone who had any sort of addiction or ailment or mental illness or even a skin disease was put outside of the city, forced to live alone or in ostracized communities. They were written off, erased, out of sight, out of mind. And to make matters worse, this man we hear in Scripture lives among the graves. Contact with corpses is a big no-no. And of course, all those swine were roaming about. But Luke's Jesus, Luke's Jesus, this Jesus is all about crossing boundaries. Why did Jesus cross the lake? When Jesus gets to the other side, as soon as he puts one holy pinky toe on dry land, he encounters this man. It's the first thing that stares Jesus square in the face. And he not only goes to the other side, but Jesus meets the other side. And what does Jesus do? 
He doesn't walk faster or lock his car doors. He just starts talking to the man. Can you imagine talking to someone we know very little about? Someone who makes us uncomfortable. What's your name, Jesus asks. Now notice that Jesus is talking here not to the man, for the man is not yet himself. My name is Legion, they say. Legion, that word legion is a military term. And it signals for us, reminds us, that this is a community under Roman occupation, a society that also ruled by taking. My name is Legion, they say. Legion is a military term, and it is a group of soldiers numbering 6,000. My name is Legion, 6,000, 6,000 soldiers, 6,000 armed and armored, 6,000 voices kicking and screaming. Have you ever felt like there were 6,000 voices in your head? 6,000 voices telling you what to do, 6,000 voices telling you what you were about, 6,000 voices telling you you were not enough or unclean. 6,000 voices echo, echoing. 6,000. But Jesus is not intimidated by 6,000 voices or 6,000 soldiers or 6,000 demons. He casts them out. He casts them out. He changes this man that has been one way his whole life and now is invited to live a different way. And in changing this man, Jesus changes the system that they have put in place to keep him right where he is. Now the people learn about it. The people learn about it, and you know what's coming. They run to see this son, this father. You mean that guy? They might have asked. That guy? He's crazy, that guy. The one that we got rid of all those years ago? That guy? Oh man, I gotta see this for myself. And so people come from far and wide and they see him and they see a new person, a new creation, someone who has changed and restored. Behold, I make all things new. I think I've heard that somewhere before. Before, before, before he was naked. Now he's clothed. Before he was out of his mind. Now he's in his right mind. Before he was shouting at the top of his lungs and now he's sitting like Mary at the feet of Jesus. Before he was struggling against chains and now he's free. Before he was trapped in an identity that society gave him. And now he is his true, truest self. Why did Jesus cross the lake? And what did he do on the other side? Well, he made change happen. And notice that the people don't like it. Jesus seemed to be the only one who wanted this change and nobody asked him for it. Scripture tells us that when the people saw that Jesus had, what he had done, that the man had been brought back to himself, they were afraid and they asked Jesus to leave. Can you imagine asking Jesus to leave? But Jesus had upset their status quo and their systems. Change is not easy. Change is not easy. All of those things that we have put into place to keep the insiders in and the outsiders out, whether in society or in churches or even in our own cultural settings, all of the things that we do to ensure familiarity, do we really want to disturb those things? It reminds me of the saying, we want things to get better, but we don't want things to change. Today, Jesus definitely upsets the apple cart. He upsets the apple cart in the foreign country of the Gerasenes. And Jesus continues to upset our apple cart every time he asks us, even now, to cross the lake 
and try to get to the other side. And we do. We get out our rows and we row and we row and we row and we try to make it to the other side. We cross the lake not just to be disruptive. That's not our goal. We cross the lake because we know that there are so many people over there just like this man. And we've all been him at some point. He's misunderstood, he's frightened, he's been kicked out, he is held captive by other people's stereotypes. We cross the lake because we know that there are still systems in place that keep people out, down, and shackled. And we cross the lake because Jesus still calls us to cross boundaries. Boundaries, no doubt, that will make us uncomfortable and maybe even angry. But we do so in the name of Jesus the boundary crosser, who went to the other side and helped a person live life and abundant life. Why did Jesus cross the lake? To get to the other side. And what's on the other side? Abundant life. Life in abundance. I've been trying to think about some modern applications of this particular story, modern applications of this man and this encounter. I've been thinking about what the other side of the lake might look like for you and me today in this time. If Jesus were to go to the other side, what might he encounter? Well, it might have looked a little bit like Jesus rowing up on the shores of St. Paul's those many years ago and suggesting that we remove some Confederate symbols. These remind me of chains, Jesus might have said. That was probably upsetting to some people. Or as we remember another shooting near Birmingham, I just can't help but think of Jesus going across the lake to the other side. Would the scene be similar if he took away just a few guns, assault rifles? Do you think people would be pleased? Do you think they might ask Jesus to leave town? We want things to get better, but do we want them to change? At the end of our story, at the end of our story, notice that this man who was once overtaken by 6,000 voices and demons is now free, free. And he wants to get into the boat and go back with Jesus. I would too. But instead, Jesus says to him, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. The man, 6,000 pounds freer, now becomes a disciple. And he is called to do God's work, and he's called to do it where the most change needs to happen, and sometimes that change needs to happen right where you are. Today is Juneteenth. The holiday's origin story begins in Galveston, Texas, which was the westernmost area of the Union in 1865. And and when enslaved people were told of their emancipation on June 19th, 1865, they had technically already been free for two and a half years prior, on January 1st. 1863. Slaveholders in Texas had kept the news of freedom to themselves. Can you imagine withholding news of freedom? Friends, why did Jesus cross the lake? And why did he go to the other side to share news of freedom? And that, my friends, is still our call. We go with Jesus to the other side of our fears, to the other side of our discomfort, to the other side of our insecurities, to proclaim to the six or sixty or six thousand voices of oppression and prejudice and violence that they have no home here. There's only one voice, 
There's only one voice that tells us who we are and what we are called to do, and it's the one who came to release the captive, set the prisoner free, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And it is into his boat that we climb and move to the other side where God's vision awaits. O Lord, lead on. Lead us to the other side, a place where the tombs have not power and the chains cannot choke. Lead us to the other side, to a place of freedom, to a place of justice, and to a place of equality and abundant life for all. May it be so.